today. Uh, this morning we're going to get started. I, I, I tell you, I had a, a wonderful trip. Uh, the Lord blessed us. He kept us safe there and back. No, no incidents. Nothing, nothing major going on there. So we were just excited to be back. Uh, I hated missing Millias last week. That, that about, uh, that about ate me up. Um, but we felt like we just needed to do, we talked to some folks, we felt like we needed to at least do our due diligence. So Monday morning we called the hospital, we called the schools, tried to figure out, you know, what's the best thing to do, what we should do, what's appropriate, what's right. And so we're good now. So uh, we're out and about and good. So, <laughs> all right. Well, this morning, let's start off by, uh, by singing together. Uh, and we're going to be singing, the Angels We Have Heard on High. Miss D, if you'll start us up, and if you would, stand with us and sing together. Up here. Does anybody have anything specific that they want to announce? 
Uh, I've got a, few, a few on my list here. Yes, ma'am. Please get one. Um, as a child, I would
Y'all, my heart was broken for the first two and a half years I was here. You say, that's so I'm working on my third year now. So we're talking about just a matter of months ago when all this COVID start, started. Y'all, you know, I confided in some of my friends, my pastor friends and all. You know, I had been out I had witnessed multiple, multiple times about the love of God and about Jesus Christ and just, and had just no response. And I would beg God, God, I know you sent me here. Why are you sent me here? Because I would look around and I would see. And it, to me, it seemed like what I was doing was I doing anything of any good? Was I was I worth anything? Was I you know was I what was I sent here for? Because I see you know a whole lot going on. God would always bless with a little something here or there, but overall I just didn't see a lot. But then something started to happen more recently, and I want you to understand that God is moving here. God is moving in Bacon and Dundee County. God is moving in Trinity Baptist Church. Y'all, when we had our first Sunday coming back from our COVID stuff and that Pentecost Sunday, there was a lady with a little dog that would walk around a little bit and heard part of my sermon. She's sitting right back there now. She knows Jesus Christ is her Savior. He's changed and changed her life dramatically, and she is growing and moving to serve God. Y'all, there are many others that I can look at. I'm not going to point out, but there's some of you here that especially just in the last months, I've seen God moving in you in such a way, changing you, moving you. I've heard stories of you talking to others and, and loving others and serving others and telling others about Christ and inviting others to church and so many different things. You know, we look right now, we're a little sparse. I think this is the time of the year. Um, but, you know, just a few Sundays ago, we were front to back, side to side, as best we could with the separation we've got and packed out. If, you know, if everybody came that, that is associated with our church, we would not have the room. Right now, we don't. We, it, it's, it's a bad thing. We don't do our children's ministry outreach that we used to. Why? Because we used to have 50 kids here, and we can't do that. We can't do that during this time of COVID. We don't have the room, the space. We don't have the ability to separate. So we can't do that right now. But after the first of the year, there are there some that are already planning. We've got a new children's ministry that's starting up. And, and, and after the first of the year, we're going to be trying to focus mostly on the kids that are here in our church. That's all we can do right this second until something changes with the space we have. But we're going to really start discipling our children and moving forward with our children. And there are people amongst you that their hearts have just been, been burdened for this, moving towards this. So you're going to see this come in the first of the year. Our women's ministry has been blossoming and blooming and, and just, just moving. We have other things going on. Miss D, look at our first announcement here. This is, this is one of our newest things right here. It's called Times. It's Trinity Youth Middle School. Amber, how many, how many middle school kids do we have on Wednesday night? I wasn't here. I was watching the other kids. How many no, kids do we have? About eight. About eight or so. Middle school. Middle school age kids. And then there were also high schools. The high schools, by the way, um, decorated this. Mark and, and several of them decorated the tree and, and did all that preparation while some of the middle schools were back here. They had a time Wednesday night. Um, but we've separated our, our junior and our senior youth, our, our middle schoolers. We're going to start a new group called Times. It's Trinity Youth in Middle School. And we're going to be reaching out. Um, there were, I had... I had 10 kids in my house Wednesday night because they all came early and, the, and they weren't ready for them over here, so they piled in my house and watched cartoons for about an hour. And there was about 10 of them. So, so you know, we are growing. Our youth ministry, Mr. you can click our next slide there. Also, we have our, our senior youth ministry right here. Um, it's going to be on Wednesday nights at 6.30. Now, the junior youth, they're going to be actually on Wednesdays, but they're going to be coming after school. We're going to encourage them just to come out on after school. They get out at 3.30. Just come on this way. We'll get started around 4. And we're going to have our times group, or our, our, our Trinity, Trinity Youth Middle School group uh, here at, at 4 o'clock. If you would like to help on that, please let us know. We'd sure love to have you uh, as part of that. But that's going, to be, that's going to be on Wednesdays. Both of these groups are going to be on Wednesdays. And then at the first year, like I said, we're going to be really focusing on looking at our children and what's going on there. We're going to be looking at so many other things. Y'all understand God is moving and God is blessing. There's no doubt. There have been six that have come to know Christ. There are six more that we're talking to right now about baptism for various, various reasons. Y'all, God is moving and God is good. Let's deal with our next announcement here. All right, for our Christmas.
Christmas time, we have three things that are coming up right uh, coming up soon. And I'll have to let you know the times on it. First of all, we are going to do Christmas caroling. Uh, we're hoping maybe that we can that we can get to a few places, but get to maybe the Hedger Home and see if they will allow us. Ms. Sue is going to be talking to them about allowing us maybe to be outside and maybe you know sing to some of the windows. You know, I think we can sing loud enough, but maybe we can do something like that and be able to reach some of those that are in there, but we'd be on the outside of the building uh, and visit some of the other folks that we have here in our church and, and then maybe just have a, a time of soup and fellowship afterwards. Uh, she is planning that, and we've got a tentative date, but there's some, some issues with scheduling and this, that, and the other. So I will, as soon as I find out for sure exactly when and what, uh, I will text all of you and put it on Facebook and everything else and get it out there, okay? So you can make sure you get that information and spread it to everybody else. Um, but I know the youth want to go caroling, and I'm hoping that, that, that our adults, we can go too. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll separate, we'll do what we need to do, and hopefully be able to just light some people up during this hard time of the year. All right, so Christmas caroling. Uh, we also have our Christmas Eve service. I texted some of you about the potential of a, of a community-wide Christmas Eve uh, service that some of the ministerial alliance was contemplating. But the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, and it was confirmed when I talked with some others in the church about it. You know, our Christmas Eve time here together is just so special. And, and I love community, I love community involvement, I love that kind of stuff and that we're talking about, you know, things for playing the cars and things like that, you know, and uh, shooting it out over the radio and stuff. But, I don't know, I, the last couple of years of our, our times together at Christmas Eve is just too special, I think, for our family. So, so that will be going on Christmas Eve. We usually start about six, okay? And listen, I want you to know something, too. This is the, You're not going to hear this very often from a preacher, okay? Preachers always say, be here, be here, be here. And I want you to be here. But I know many of you are so faithful. We even have several out today, but they're very faithful to this church in a lot of ways. So if you can't make it Christmas Eve, I understand that. To be honest with you, I used to, I used to the tradition in our family for many years was that we would have a Christmas Eve together uh, with extended with our, my, my, my parents and, and our nieces and nephews and all of them and all of their families, and we would have a big time. Um, so I know that many of you have, and don't, so don't feel, don't feel like you're sinning if you're not here. But those of you that, want, that are able to spend the time together on Christmas Eve, 6 o'clock here, and we're going to open up God's Word, we're going to read the story together, light some candles, and just have a time of worship together. Alright? That's on Christmas Eve. Now our last thing is we have a Christmas Day meal. And this, this is not for just, just everybody, but I mean, well, no, take that back. It's for anybody who would like to. But it's specifically aimed if you or you know of some folks that don't have extended family here, uh, and so they don't have anywhere to go to grandparents' house or to here or to there, and eat and enjoy and fellowship. Um, we're going to actually have a meal here uh, on Christmas Day. It'll be, it's usually after, afternoon sometime. Uh, I don't know what time we did last year. We'll let you know the time. But if you don't have extended family to go to, uh, kind of like Amber and I, um, Plan on being here with us. Last year we had a good sized group and, and had a wonderful time. Ended up staying longer than we thought we were, didn't we? We stayed, played games, and, and just ate and just had a great time together. So if you or someone you know doesn't have that family to be with, or if you just want to come and join us, you have a free time that afternoon, come and join us and be together. We're just going to spend some time in fellowship and uh, remembering our Savior on that day and eating. All right. Any other announcements we have this morning? Boy, we've done a lot of intro here. I might have to go short on the sermon. Oh, well. That's all right. All right, Miss D, what we got next? All right, children's time. Kids' time. Come on up. Woo! All right, then it goes in Shrella. And then Hurley Free. All right. A little shorter on our kids today. And short kids do. Just kidding. Sit this right up here. Right. All right, Miss D, go ahead and click it to that next slide there. It'll be fine. I think everybody's seen my beautiful, uh, my beautiful artistic PowerPoint up there with the children. All right, let me read this scripture to you real quick. Listen, members, I want you to listen. This is this is part of the story of Jesus. You see right here. Listen to this part. It says, "Now there were in the same country. That means near Bethlehem." There were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, 
And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Trella and Lindy Rose, who is this little baby right here? Baby Jesus. That's right, that's baby Jesus. And at Christmas we celebrate baby Jesus' birth, right? God, he has always been, but he was born into a little baby. And he grew up and he loved us and he taught us and he, he healed people and just loved us so much, right? That's the baby Jesus we celebrate. And by the way, you notice this is morning as Christine put this up. This is our this is our traditional um, nativity scene that Brother Jack would bring every every year. Uh, so that's very special. Oh, this one this one's just different. I'll talk about that another time. Yeah. So this is beautiful. But let me ask you something. Well, what is this? A candy cane. Do you know what it what it represents? The shape of it, like this. It has to do with the people that the angels were talking to up here. Who were the angels talking to? Do you remember? Exactly, the shepherds. And this is kind of like the shepherd's staff. You know, the shepherd's staff was important because what they would do is they took care of, yeah, they needed to. But it was, it was important because they would take care of their sheep. Because when their sheep would run and, and like were about to fall over a cliff or fall in the river, because sheep are dumb. Sheep are really dumb. They are. They really don't. They do dumb stuff. So they were all over in places, okay? So the shepherd would run over there and he would hook them and he'd pull them back. Yeah? And that was what the shepherd's staff. And when we think of the shepherds, we think of a star and we think of the angels proclaiming Jesus' birth, all these things. But there's more to this. Look at the color. What are the colors on there? That's right, red and white. Now the red, it represents something important. What does it represent? Jesus' blood, that's right. It represents some of the sad part we think about Christmas. That this little baby right here that was born, oh, it's, it's wonderful to see a little baby. But you know, that baby grew up, and he was hung on a cross, and he died and shed his blood for us because he loved us so much. He took our punishment because of the bad things that we do on that cross. But what happens when you start licking and sucking on this? Does the red stay there? Does the red stay there or does it go away? And what color is left? White. That's right. You know, sometimes we can think about the life of Jesus and think about the sad thing that He had to die on the cross for us, but over time, and we, the more we think about it, we realize that He did that so that we could be white as snow. And even though He suffered for a time, He's not suffering anymore, and when He comes back, He's going to be King of all things. And he is pure and white, just like he's made us on that cross. Now, we know that this was a shepherd's staff. But let me ask you something. If you turn it this way, what is that? Am I doing it that way? No, nope, that way. There. What is that? No? Look at it. A chair. And what does that represent? Jesus. That's right. So a candy cane is very important because it's a great reminder of the things that we celebrate this year. Okay, let me let you watch something real quick. One more, the best for last. A Christmas present. Oh, how beautiful. What does it remind you of? This, is that what it's supposed to be? Mm-hmm, it's a candy cane. It's almost too pretty to eat. <laughs> Almost. Mmm, peppermint. But everyone knows peppermint is green, or sometimes pink, but never red. This is something new. Why does it have to be red? Sometimes different colors mean different things. Do you know what a symbol is, Lucy? That's when something stands for something else. Oh, the red means something. Yes. Something happy? Well, like most Christmas stories, it turned out happy. When I look at this, I see so many things. I see a bright star, shepherds, angels. 
A mother singing a lullaby? A baby who grew up and chose to go through a sad time to suffer and die because, well, because he cares for us. And I see our happiness because he made that choice. Did he stay sad? No, which is what I want you to remember when you eat that. You see, if you keep licking it, the red stripes will go away. Just like his sadness. <gasps> Look! There you go. You know, my grandmother's mother lived all the way on the other side of the ocean. When she was a little girl and she went to church at Christmas, the choir master always gave her a candy cane to remind her of the shepherds. And to keep her quiet, they say she was quite a little chatterbox. I never talk in church. Good for you. Well, almost never. Of course, her candy cane was plain sugar. It wasn't until, oh, right around when I was a boy that someone added the peppermint. And then only a few years ago, someone decided to add the red stripes. To remind us of his sadness. We all go through hard times, Lucy. But sometimes happiness and sadness are this close together. That's something else you can think about as the red disappears. I will. And maybe this too. Another reminder of Jesus.
and while you're standing, if you're still in, um, this is our memory verse that we've been doing. Um, and I think, I think I saw in the video that, uh, that y'all have been keeping up with it, which is really good. But uh, this is just the, 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 the center of who we are because of this little baby, because of what he grew up to do, because of his love for us. This is who we are as the church. So let's start, let's say it together. John chapter 4, verses 34, 35, and 36. I think I'll And Jesus said unto them, My need is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then come the harvest. For behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are right already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit to life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Amen. You may be seen.
but I want to make some points, all right? So, Brother Rod, if you would click those likes. Miss D, click on this video real quick.
But my friends, if the Bible does not say it directly, do not proclaim it. And Steve, you clicked one time. Now, I believe in the Bible. That's where I get my information. I believe that the Bible is truth. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? But the question I want you to, I want you to answer is why do you believe that? Why? All right, Miss D. Make sure I'm right. Yeah. Listen, only God can say for sure what is true. And you say, well, he's in the scripture. That's true. But why do you believe the scripture? Do you believe the scripture because you were raised in church? Do you believe the scripture because you like Brother Mike and he says so? Do you believe the scripture because mom and daddy taught you that the Bible was God's word? Is that why you believe the scriptures? My friends, listen. It is only God who can prove to you that the scripture is his word. That it is what he claims it to be. That it is full truth. And he will do that in many ways. He will do that spiritually. Click on that next one there, Miss D. There's a, in John 8, 32, it says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That is a promise there that He promises us He will lead us and show us what the truth is. And it's important, but He'll do that spiritually. There's no way I can stand up here, even if I was the smartest guy in the world, if I stood up here and convinced you with my words that God is who He says He is in the Bible, then you would, you would have a false faith because you would be believing in my arguments rather than in the relationship and the spiritual direction that God gives. It is only God who will lead you to all truth. And the first thing He will do is lead you and say that His Word, Scripture, is that truth. This is where you will find His truth, full truth. Not believe it because I said so, but believe it because He will prove it to you in your heart. Now that last verse there, John 17, 17, says sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Understand, don't believe just because it's what you do. Don't believe just because it's the way you were raised. Don't believe because you like the person that's preaching it. Believe because you look at the evidence. You weigh it and God shows you the truth. All right, Miss D, our next slide there. One more of these to look at. Go ahead, Miss D. Brother Ron. How do you know what's true is really true? That's where the evidence comes in. Christ's offer to turn you into a new person is real. It is claimed to be God's true. So let's consider the evidence of eight prophecies proving his claim is true. Do you know what the probability factor is of only eight prophecies? No. A one in ten to the seventeenth power. One in ten to the seventeenth power. Huh? That's one in ten to this many times. I don't get it. If you were to take ten to the seventeenth power, Girl Scout then meant cookies. How many? That's a lot of quintillion cookies. And spread them across the state of Texas. Yeehaw! They would cover every inch of the state and form a pile of Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies two feet deep. That's a lot of Thin Mints. A whole lot of Thin Mints. Now take one more Thin Mint and lick all the chocolate off, toss it into that pile and stir the whole thing up. Blindfold yourself, walk the entire state from Amarillo to Laredo, stopping just once to stoop down and pick a single blind Thin Mint cookie. The blindfold. Oh, nuts. The chances of you picking the chocolate this cookie is the same as the chance that one person could have fulfilled just eight prophecies about Jesus in one lifetime. That's crazy. It's unthinkable. But Jesus Christ did not fulfill eight prophecies in one lifetime. Whoa. He fulfilled over 300. 300 now! Whoa. And 29 of them prophecies are historically documented. The facts that actually happened to Jesus are historically documented. But there's only one thing left to do. I know. For me to weigh the evidence. It's all part of the evidence. Because if it is true that he is the Son of God, what he offers you, a new life in him, is real. Now I know it's real whether I believed it or not. It's all part of the evidence.
I love that style of stuff. <laughs> These videos are actually out of, a, out of a middle school youth series by Josh McDowell. And uh, I've, I've always loved those. I taught them, oh, it's been a lot of years ago that I taught that. Um, but I always love those videos. I love that, that way of, of saying, did you, did you understand what it said? It said, it said the chances, okay, we're talking statistically here, the chances of, of Jesus fulfilling eight of the prophecies in the Old Testament are 10 to the 17th power, or, or, one, or excuse me, 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That's, that's like taking over a quintillion cookies covering Texas, the entire, entire state of Texas, two feet deep, stirring it up, blindfolding yourself and walking around and finding that one cookie that you lick the chocolate off of. I mean, can, can, you, can, can, you, imagine, can you conceive of that? That is, that is hardly any chance at all. And that's the statistical chance of someone living up to only eight of the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus did live up. But Jesus himself lived up to over 300. Now, I'll be honest with you, some of those things, when you look at some of the prophecies, some of them are things that could have just been done. Okay? There are some things that, that just could have been, you know, he could have decided to do something specific. And in fact, in Scripture, if you remember, there, there are certain times when he said this was done um, this was done in order to fulfill the prophecy that this would occur. So that did happen. But the vast majority of these, many of these prophecies were things that were not in his control. It was not in his control that he would be born where he was. It was not in his control that he would be killed like he was killed. That the circumstances of his life would be as they were. Now, again... Why did I give that first part about, uh, about believing? Because God, God shows it because, again, I also don't want you to have an intellectual faith. There are, there are many people that choose their faith, choose to believe in God, because they actually searched and began to find out that historical evidence, archaeological evidence, this is all the stuff that I taught these middle schools years ago, um, liter literary evidences, all of these, these, these true scientific evidences, if you look into these things, they prove that the Bible is what it says. It proves that the, that the characters that you read about were real characters. It proves that, that, they, that they lived as they lived and what it said. The only thing that it does not prove, though, that science cannot prove, is that this is words, the Word of God and it is God's full, ultimate truth. No science can prove that. That's something that God has to prove to you himself. But you know something? But for me, over time, it has been very encouraging that, that even though I believe in this, when someone comes up to me and says, yeah, you believe in that stuff, but you just live in it. You live in some fantasy world. You just have some sort of blind faith. And I can say, well, let me tell you something. Uh, yeah, my faith comes from my relationship with God. He's proved himself inside. And there's nothing I can say to you to convince you. But now... These things truly did happen. And there is even physical evidence showing you that much of what we read in here is exactly as it says it was. Now today I just want to go over a few of these prophecies. Not a whole lot, just, just a few of them. And show you when they were made. And remind you of when they came about. Alright? Alright, Miss Dean? All right. Now these are the prophecies of the true Christ from the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. Okay. All right, Miss D, click on that next one. Oh. oh man, I messed up. That's okay. Let me ask you a question. Where does the Bible say of what tribe would Jesus come from? It's already up there. The tribe of Judah. That was my fault. I was I was a click ahead. But it came but coming from the tribe of Judah. Now, many of you understand or remember about what the tribe of Judah is. You remember that, that, that prophecy also said that he would be a son of Abraham. He'd come from Abraham, so he would be a, a Jewish person. He'd be a Hebrew, he'd be an Israelite, okay? So he would come from Abraham, he'd come from Isaac, he'd come from Jason, Jacob, uh, excuse me, Jacob, uh, who was renamed who? Jacob was renamed Israel. Israel, exactly. Jacob was renamed Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, and Judah was one of those sons and one of the tribes of Israel. So he would come from Judah. All right, Misty. Now, Genesis 49 says this. It says, Judah, your brother, shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. 
Judah is a lion's cub from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as a lioness, who dared, who dares rouse her? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until the tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Judah was proclaimed that it would always rule. It would always have a king on the throne, but then ultimately the true king would come from that same tribe. You can find a lot of interesting stuff about that too in the book of, uh, of Malachi. I love Malachi, but it's Malachi, of course. But you can find that in Malachi, and you can see uh, this idea of, you know, we don't see Jesus as a crouching lion. We don't see him as a, something we'd say, who would dare arouse him? But if you look at the back of the book of Malachi, you'll see those, that wording about, about the Christ and what he brought, because what he brought to us was not only his love and his concern, which that came in his healing, but he also brought to us an ideal. He also brought to us an example. And from that comes the conviction of our souls, of who we are, how we live. But he would come from Judah. Miss D, our next one. Now, he would also be in a specific line. There were prophecies that claimed, first of all, there was a promise made to Abraham that through him and through his generations, the whole world would be blessed. And now Abraham had two children, okay? But specifically, it was Isaac that, that the Christ would come through. God chose Isaac. That's in Genesis 17, by the way. Now, Isaac then also had two children. And, of course, in both cases, both with Abraham and Isaac, the firstborn should have received the inheritance and should have received uh, the direction of the family and everything else, but God chose differently. So Isaac then chose Jacob over his brother Esau. Now Jacob, who changed his name, or whose name was changed later to Israel, had 12 sons who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. So out of these 12 sons, the, the, the number one son, Judah, was the one chosen. Judah would be the one to bear the Christ. Then out of Judah, it, there's a prophecy that says that from Jesse would come the Christ. Y'all know who Jesse is, or that's King David's father. But Jesse had eight sons. Could have been any of these sons. But God chose David, who would become king. So the prophecy would be that he would come from David. Now we look into the New Testament there in Matthew and Luke. You can see the scripture references up there. But Matthew gives us a genealogy of Christ. And in fact, his genealogy, though, is the genealogy from the ruling line, who came from David's son Solomon. Okay? Remember, Solomon became king after, after David. And that ruling line from Solomon on down came to Christ. Well, actually came Joseph. Okay? And now we know that Joseph was not the physical father of Christ, but he was the adopted father of Christ. And by Jewish standard and Jewish law, adoption held a strong, um, a strong tie as blood birth did. So Jesus qualified to be ruler of Israel through the line of David and Solomon. But then we also say, see, through direct, you know, his mother Mary who had him, she too was from the line of David, but she came actually from the line of Nathan, who was the son of David. So we see two different instances. One, Matthew shows us how Jesus came from this ruling line. And then, of course, Luke then shows us how he came through his mother, also from the line of David. So twofold has come to us from these prophecies that were written, that he would come from Abraham, from Isaac, from Jacob, from Jesse, and from David. So these prophecies were fulfilled. All right, next up, Miss Steve. All right, now, from what city of this tribe of Judah did he come? All right, what city was he born in? All right, Miss D, click that. Let's see if we're trying. <laughs> we know we are. So out of all of these places, where would he be found? He was found in Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. Now let me tell you about Bethlehem. Bethlehem was the biggest city of the time. Bethlehem was a metropolis full of all of the most wealthy, all of the most educated, all of the best people you could ever imagine. If you were born in Bethlehem, it, would, it meant that you were going to you were going to rule the nation. You were, you were part of the cream of the crop, the best of the best. Isn't that right? Is that what Bethlehem was about? No. Bethlehem was about my people. Bethlehem, Bethlehem was a little town. Bethlehem was just this, this, this little town. Our next scripture there, Micah 5, 2. It says, 
But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient times. This is the book of Micah, 700 years, 700 plus years before the birth of Christ. It was proclaimed that he would come from Bethlehem. Well, that was easy enough. If they're going to set up this kid and they get Mary and Joseph, they send him to Bethlehem. But did they also control the, the, the calling of the census? All of the things involved there. There's no way anyone would orchestrate such a thing. That 700 years before a prophecy would be made and circumstances would come about and bring this child into this little town that didn't even have enough places to stay that he had to be born in a barn. They're in a manger. We see this then fulfilled in Luke 2, 1 through 7. We see that Mary had this baby wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them to be in. And it was this little nowhere backwards town of Bethlehem that God chose to be born into this world. All right, Miss D. Now, something special would be about his birth. Now, this particular thing is something that no one else can say. That he was to be born of a virgin. That's right. Our next passage, Miss D, the next one now. This is Isaiah 7, 14. Written, written somewhere between 740 and uh, 685 B.C. Okay, that's that many years before Christ, okay, before that time of Christ. It says, Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call His name Emmanuel. Prophesied 700 years before the birth of Christ, and brought about by the Holy Spirit of God. I miss thee. Now, what else would make this story special? I'm not going to ask you specific because this is because there's so many other things that, that actually make it special. Miss Dee, bring up that second piece of that. There's so many things that would make this special, but there were prophecies that directly stated that he would flee for his life, even as a baby, and be visited by some very special people. Prophesied many years before. All right, Miss D, Psalm 72. Verses 10 through 11, written a thousand plus years before the birth of Christ. It says, May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Sheba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. The idea that is presented in the prophecy that was given was that leaders and great men, rulers and wise would come and would fall down and would worship him. Now, I believe that prophecy was fulfilled when we see the wise men coming, but I also believe that that prophecy is still to be fulfilled also. There will come a day when every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether they accept Him as their Savior or they don't, they will fall before Him, all kings and all people. But this is talking, you know, in Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12, it's talking about those wise men, men from the east who came seeking Him. They saw His sign in the stars. Now, there's an indication that if you follow, now you've got to get outside the Bible and look at, at historical references, but if you follow this organization that they believe that these, these, these wise men from this Orient area came from, this may be the same magi, the same type of people, that their roots go all the way back to Babylon. And who was in Babylon and prophesied of the coming Christ? Who was also a, uh, one of these magi at that time? A wise man before the king. They threw him in a lion's den. Daniel, that's right. Daniel prophesied of this Christ. Daniel was amongst these wise men, this organization of ancient times that, that would study all of nature, study all things. And so they had in their history this understanding that this God of these, of these Israelites was to send a king. So these men came, we always say three because there was three gifts, but we don't really know how many there were, there probably were more, we don't know. But they brought these three gifts, and they came to, they came to Israel, and, and they didn't know where to go. They saw a star, but, uh, but they weren't sure exactly where to go. So they go to the king, they assume that if a king is to be born, he's going to be born into the throne, right? He's going to be born into, as, as king of the nation. So they go before Herod, and they say, they tell him what they have seen in the stars. 
And so Herod says, well, let me see. And so he goes to his men, his, his Jewish men who know the history, and say, where is he going to be born? What's going on? It's supposed to be in Bethlehem. Oh, okay. So he says to the wise men, go and worship him. And when you find him and you know right where he is, come back and let me know so that I can go and worship him. But is that truly his reason? So the wise men, these men, were directed by an angel and they went home a different way rather than going back and telling Herod. So something happened. Jeremiah 31, 15, this day, that 625 plus years before Christ. It says, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel is weeping for her children. Remember Rachel, the mother of Judah. She is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. The wise men don't come back. Herod knows in general where he is, somewhere around Bethlehem. But he doesn't know how to pick which one it is. So he goes into the area and he slaughters every child from two years old to below. Before this happens, an angel comes to Joseph and says, Take the child and flee into Egypt. So our next passage, Ms. D. Hosea 11.1, 1, written 750 years before Christ. It says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So they fled to Egypt until Herod died. And they were called back, and there was some some things happened here and there. Joseph was a little leery, but they finally came back into Israel. And he was raised there again. We see the fulfillment of this in Matthew 2, 13 through 15, and then 19 through 21. So you can click on the next one there. Now, I'm going to just stop there. But there were 300, over 300 prophecies written in the Old Testament hundreds and thousands of years before the birth of Christ that were fulfilled through the life of Jesus Christ. We do not live some blind faith. We do not believe just because we feel something. We do not believe just because mom and daddy told us so. We don't believe just because the preacher is very charismatic. We believe, first of all, because we accept Him. And He comes in and He begins to dwell in us. He changes us. He moves us. He teaches us. And He shows us that, that word right there, that that is pure truth. When it says it, that is truth. Again, that's not something you can convince somebody. It's something that you have to enter into that relationship. You have to see and He will show you and prove to you. But understand, our faith is not an ignorant faith. Not only studying in the Bible, but studying in, in history, studying in archaeology, studying in literature, and many other forms, we see and we realize the things that this book says, the people that it talks about, the money that it talks about, the, the errors of time, the kings, the, the history, all the things that are there have been proven even many times in science. But again, I don't want you to keep that as the source of your faith. I want you to trust in Jesus Christ. I want you to have a relationship in Jesus Christ because He has come into your life and He has proved Himself to you. He has shown Himself to you. And He's with you every day. That is the source of our faith. As always, I go back to this same issue, the same thing. All of Scripture, all of creation, from the very beginning, His creation of us was for one purpose. Not to worship Him. Okay? Not to serve Him. We do those things because He's worthy. But that's not why He created us. He created us for one thing, starts with an R, and it is relationship. Exactly. It is a relationship with God that directs our lives. That grows our faith.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord God, this morning we love you. Lord God, I thank you for these that are here, dear God. These beautiful faces, God, that I miss so much. Lord, I thank you for your word, dear God, that is not just a book full of ignorant writings, dear God, that, that were changed over time to fit the times, dear God. But Lord God, it is a living document, Lord, written by the hand of your men, dear God, but by your inspiration, dear God. It is your word, your truth. So God, in a world that there are so many opinions and so many people saying so many different things, dear God, that we don't know where to turn or what to believe, dear God, we can go into your word. And though, dear God, we may not be able to find all truth, dear God, in our lifetime, dear God, we, Lord, we can find truth every day that we open it. We can find more and more stability and security and peace, dear God, in your truth, knowing that what we read and what we study is true and right. And not just an opinion or the way we feel, Lord. But dear God, truth ordained by you, by your mouth, dear God, your word. Lord God, we thank you for those that are Lord, visiting with us this morning. We thank you, dear God, for all of our faithful that are here, dear God. Lord, I ask, dear God, that you bless this church. That during the season of Christmas, Lord, that, um, Lord, though it gets very busy, that we remember you and what you have done. And that, dear God, we share that joy and that love and that peace and that message, Lord, with Lord, all we come in contact with. Lord, you did not have to save us. But Lord God, you did. And you did it by sending your Son. Lord, to be born into a body. To, Lord, to deny all of the rights and the privileges that he had as God. To live among us. To be tempted as we are tempted. To suffer all things that we suffer and more, dear God. Then, dear God, to take our punishment, to take our hell upon Himself on that cross, to take our death, to take our pain that we deserve for the sin, or that so easily besets us, Lord. Lord, fill us with Your Spirit. Lord, the spirit of Christmas, dear God, is the same as, Lord, the spirit of each other week of the year. It is your spirit, your joy, your peace. Lord God, we love you. Bless this church, this community. Lord, that they might turn to you and find salvation. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're able, stand with me. Let's sing our closing song. The family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sun. For I'm part of the family. Family of God. God bless you.